Good morning, everyone. For those who don't know me yet, my name is Ron Levine from Mindfulness in Blue Jeans. I've been practicing mindfulness and insight meditation for almost 25 years. And I was introduced to the practice during a time when I was dealing with clinical anxiety and depression and a raging panic disorder that had blown up into agoraphobia. I was on disability from work. I was unable to leave the house and happened to get paired up with a psychologist who, even back in the late 90s, was already several decades deep into practicing and teaching mindfulness and insight meditation. And that was my beginning on this journey. And uh, no one was more surprised than I was when the stuff actually did something. (laughs) I had no confidence in this whatsoever. And ironically, that was some of what helped me have so much early success, I think, was I didn't really have any expectations. And I was like, all right, well, I'm just going to give this a shot and I'll just see what happens, expecting nothing to happen. And since I wasn't really looking for any particular result, I was able to see a lot of things very quickly. So it kind of worked out in my favor. And here I am, 25 years later, still practicing, teaching. And I'm happy and honored to be part of this ongoing circle, this community of folks that have shared what we've all found for ourselves, what others have shared with us. Since the historical Buddha started sharing his teachings 25 or 2,600 years ago now. And here we are today, and the teachings are still as relevant to our lives today, wherever you happen to be in the world, as they were two and a half millennia ago, right? So I'm glad to have you with me today. Thanks for joining. Today is the next in our ongoing series of Calm, Calming Anxiety by Living Mindfully, where, as I say, I share some of the techniques that people have shared with me that I've stumbled upon for myself. And I find that even though we each may have different things that spark fear, anxiety, distress for each of us, the experiences of of these things tend to be about the same. There's a lot of overlap. And so, regardless of what might be sparking our distress, our fear, our anxiety. These various tools and techniques have a way of working for whatever it is, you know, some better than others. So we take the best and we leave the rest. So let's jump in with today's. Okay. I always like to begin my sitting by imagining I am suspended from the ceiling by a piece of string attached to the top of my head as a nice cue to sit up straight without adding any extra tension to do so. And as I always say, if there is some tension here, that's absolutely fine. Tension is allowed to be here. The coming and going of different kinds of tension is part of this living experience. We run into a lot of trouble when we think we need to not ever have any tension. And in fact, may try to force our tension away. Which requires what? Bringing more tension to our tension in an attempt to get rid of tension. (sighs) Doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense. So we simply notice... Oh, there may be some tension here. Physical tension, emotional tension, psychological tension. Or perhaps there isn't any tension. Hey, what this what's this guy talking about? I'm not experiencing any tension. Okay. We can notice there's a lack of tension. It's less about what's actually here more about we are noticing 
what's actually here. And perhaps noticing our reaction to what's actually here. Because that reaction is something else that's actually here. And if you haven't already, you may begin to bring your attention to your breathing. And the breathing is something that is allowed to be here simply as it is. Just like any tension or any lack of tension. We can shape and control our breathing in this practice, but we do not have to. And I typically do not. It can be very instructive to try to simply observe the breathing as it is without trying to shape it, control it. And very often what we notice when we try to do that is it's very hard to watch the breathing, bring our attention to the breathing without shaping or controlling it somehow. And that's fine. We don't then have to try to control the controlling to make it go away, which makes about as much sense as bringing tension to tension to try to make it go away. Again, we simply notice that that's what's here. If that's what's here. Oh, there's some controlling and shaping. This is what it feels like. Or, I don't notice any controlling or shaping. And this is what it feels like. Now, one of the things that I've come to notice when I'm feeling particularly anxious, stressed, depleted, is I'm sending my energy outward, my focus, my attention. All looking outward. Perhaps 
focusing on some upcoming situation, a task, a job, interaction with a person, maybe something from the past. Again, some interaction, something that maybe didn't go so well. So much of our attention, our focus throughout the day is going outward. Whether it's in interactions or or driving, or even if we're, as I once was, completely housebound. Our attention may be going out to a phone, computer, TV screen. And I get this mental image of these hundreds or thousands of tiny little arrows, like these little cartoon arrows. That are inside of me. Kind of like up against the edge of the inside of my skin. All pointing and pulsating in an outward direction. And that's all my energy going in this outward direction. All my focus. Sending it all outward. And I notice I'm not really getting a lot back. And sometimes I talk about this concept of how are we paying attention? How are we investing our attention? How are we investing our energy? So this is kind of like trying to invest your money by throwing it out the window. Just sending it outward. Nothing comes back. So I'm like, well, wait a minute. Let's... Let's let these arrows stay where they are, but just turn them around. Now they're all pointing inward towards my center, towards my core. And they're still moving and shifting and pulsating, but inward. And I see this as the breath energy. The outside world doesn't need all that energy I've been sending out. (laughs) It's got enough shit going on. (laughs) If anything, it it needs to calm down a little bit. It doesn't need me putting more stuff out there and depleting myself in the process. How do I invest this energy inward? Bring the attention inward. Bring the focus inward.
typically when I'm feeling anxious or stressed, the first physical manifestation is I start tensing up my stomach. So I'll bring the attention there first. Like, okay, let's have all these pulsating arrows of breath energy. Move to that area. Point to that area. Surround it. Permeate it. Not in an attempt to do anything. But again, to see what happens. Maybe nothing happens right away. That's fine. We just notice that. And keep at it for a minute or two. And see what happens. Maybe something. Maybe nothing. Even if nothing seems to happen, it's still better than sending all that energy outwards and getting nothing back. It's still a more skillful way of paying attention. Notice if there's a particular part of your body that could use some of that breath energy. Or maybe those inner arrows could point towards. Maybe there's a couple of parts of the body at the same time. There's no shortage of arrows. There's as many as you need. We're investing the breath energy. But the arrows themselves are free. Use as many as you want.
At some point, you may begin to feel the arrows and the breath energy throughout the entire body. In time, as we invest wisely in this way, these things grow. At some point, we grow so much energy that, well, now we can start sharing it with the world again, directing some outward, because we've got plenty. But what we're sending outward is so much better than before because we're doing it from a a place of abundance. It's not always going to feel like we have an abundance and that's fine. There are times when, okay, feeling a little depleted again. So let's get those arrows pointed inward. We build back up again. Maybe we have to do that a few times a year. Maybe we have to do that a few times a day. Maybe we have to do that a few times an hour. Maybe for a while we only do that, especially when we're just starting out, learning how to do this. An advanced practice isn't one where we never have to recharge. Now, that's not the mark of a strong practice. Strong practice isn't that we never have to recharge. A strong practice is we do notice when we have to recharge and we do that. Strong practice is one where we give ourselves what we need. You're allowed to give yourself what you need. And in fact, I highly recommend it. It took me a while to learn that one. So notice when you need to turn your arrows, your breath energy, inward. Even if it's just one breath at a time. Because it's always just going to be one breath at a time anyway. It can't be any other way. One breath at a time is 
how we walk our path. Thank you, everyone. I'll hang on for a moment if anyone would like to share anything in the chat. Laura, I like the image of the arrows. Works with my theme for the new year, Focus on Me in 2023. I like it. That's good stuff. Yeah, I tend to be very visually oriented, so I get a lot of mental pictures for things. That's one that's been coming up for me lately is seeing all these, these little cartoon arrows inside of me just well where are they pointing and i notice oh things are things are feeling a little depleted like oh well maybe that focus is outward what happens if i turn it inward for a while and i find it helpful it's a helpful mental image so glad you like that cheers Uh, from Linda, I was a bit uncomfortable with the visual of pointy arrows pointing inward, especially, and then all of a sudden those pointy arrows turned into tiny hearts. Interesting. I like that, how they turned into tiny hearts. That's really interesting. And I could see where an inward pointing of arrows could be taken as something threatening, perhaps. Like, oh, everything's pointing inward. Like, everybody's looking at me kind of a thing, you know? So... These things that I offer, some of them are going to resonate with some people, some of them are going to not resonate with others. You know, like I said at the beginning, we take the best and leave the rest. I remember um, a really profound moment for me when I first started teaching. It's something that my, my own teacher always said to me, and particularly when I told him I was thinking of starting teaching, you know, years ago, he said to me, and this was something he didn't even say just in relation to my wanting to start teaching. This was something that he had constantly said in our work together up until then was the importance of what he says not putting on somebody else's experience you don't tell people what they're going to experience you don't know what people are going to experience so you don't say okay try this and you're going to experience that i don't know what the hell you're going to experience <laughs> hell half the time i don't know what i'm going to experience right how am i supposed to know what you're going to experience and it was around that time that I had discovered a really helpful technique for myself where, like I say, I'm very visually oriented. So even when I'm listening to a piece of music, you know, something auditory, I get a mental picture of it. And I know I'm not the only one like this, but it's just, you know, I'm very visually oriented. And one of my challenges in this practice is as I'm sitting with the eyes closed and I'm watching the breathing, mental images will arise. And particularly for me, I do my daily sitting in the morning, very soon after I've gotten up. And stuff that I've dreamed about just a few minutes earlier, basically, will start coming to mind. And that becomes, you know, something coming up, taking me away from the breathing, right? And I realized at one point that if I focus my eyes, even if they're closed... But if I still focused my eyes on like, you know, the blackness of the inside of my eyelids, if I focus my eyes, I found that I am unable to hold a mental image. I can't focus my eyes physically, even with them closed, and entertain a mental image at the same time. I was like, oh, isn't this interesting? So if I focus my eyes... Then in the moment that I have them focused and I've got my attention on my breathing and on this eye focus, I can't also hold a mental image that will take me off into some daydream or reminiscence or whatever. I was like, oh, okay, this is really helpful. So I started practicing with that. And my very first ever one-on-one -on -one session with a private client, I offered him this technique. And explained why I tried it 
and we went through it together and, and he tried it with a number of other things and at the end of the sitting, he said, okay, so I noticed this about this and I noticed this about this. And he was like, oh, and that thing about focusing your eyes. I said, yeah. He said, that sucked. <laughs> like, that had the exact opposite effect for me as the one you said it had for you. And I was like, really? Interesting. Interesting. Which again, drove home for me right away. And it was a great first experience for me to have as a teacher. Was someone flat out saying, yeah. That thing that works for you, oh, that did not work for me. Which again, came right back to what my teacher would always say, don't put on somebody else's experience. So we offer things, but can't tell you how it's going to land for you. That's something you have to find for yourself. And the ones that land, roll with them for a while. The ones that don't land, don't. Maybe come back to it later. Maybe at a future time, it'll be different. But yeah, it's been a huge thing for me is this learning not to put on somebody else's experience. We have no idea. We have no idea what other people are going through. We have no idea what other people have gone through. If somebody's gone through the exact same thing we have, we have no idea how it landed for them. How many of the problems that we have with each other are coming from people assuming that everybody else's experience of a certain thing is the same as theirs, right? We always expect other people to behave the way that we think will behave. We expect other people to think the way that we think. We expect other people to experience the way that we experience. And But then we get upset when other people make those assumptions about us, right? <laughs> and it's not even necessarily a conscious thing. It's just kind of this assumption. Like, well, why wouldn't everybody just think that way? Or everybody, you know. So it's a huge part of this. If we can go in, you know, if you're starting to learn how to teach something, that to me might be the single most important thing to realize is, you know, going into it is like, we don't know what anybody's experience is. We don't know what anybody's experience with what we offer is going to be. Half the time, we're not all that clear on what our own experience is. Right? How often are we arguing with our own experience and trying to shape our experience in a certain way? All right? Isn't that what we're always doing? At some level, if you boil it down, aren't we ultimately always trying to maximize our pleasure and minimize our pain? What is that? That's an experience. Right? And that's one of the things we're doing here is we're not arguing with our experience. We're like actually opening up saying, no, 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 hang on. What the hell is my experience? What is this experience when I'm not endlessly fucking with it? Trying to make it the way I want, make it the way I think it should be. What actually is it like? And Donna, cheers. Glad you enjoyed this morning. And Lisa Nanda, yeah, this is why we can't all do the same type of yoga. Yeah, this is great phrase in yoga class, which is every body is different. Every body is different. Uh, Ren, I always think no one experiences things as bad as I do. Like, for example, my anxiety is for sure the worst. I'm feeling so special. Yeah, right? That's the funny thing is, we always feel like we're the only one. And the real irony is those things where we feel like we're the only one tend to be the things that the most people are experiencing. There are so many people all out there feeling a certain thing and thinking, I'm the only one. So you could just countless I'm the only ones out there not realizing we're all just surrounding each other uh, Linda to really understand something teach it yeah <laughs> I remember um, shortly after I started teaching I said to my teacher you know something I've learned is that 90% of teaching is learning and he said oh no no, 95% of teaching is learning. I was like, ah. 
<laughs> Got it. And he's right. <laughs> I learned that he's right, too. Yeah. So that seems like a good note to wrap up on. Thank you all so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day and week. Take care. Cheers.